welcome to our uh, white army class on uh, end series simplified end series and uh, we had studied about uh, pharynx basic clinical anatomy in our last class so let's move forward with our pharynx nasal pharynx and uh, let's learn about our first part of pharynx which is our uh, nasopharynx okay so nasopharynx is again one of the most important topics for our exams um, shall it be our uh, entrance exams or our uh, university exams and uh, apart from exams our main aim here is to treat patients as being doctors not just score marks or uh, get correct answers in our exams so let us study about our nasopharynx first let's come to our anatomy of our nasopharynx so roof of the like i told you before roof of the nasopharynx is formed by two things one is base of skull which is one is base occiput and the other is base sphenoid okay base occiput and base sphenoid two parts of the base of the skull forms the roof of the nasopharynx whatever i'm telling is i'm anteriorly looking at the nasopharynx from the front view see this is my from suppose you are looking at my nasopharynx this is how it's going to look the roof is formed by base occiput and base sphenoid lateral wall i will explain in detail lateral wall is again formed by the mucosa and like i explained the walls of pharynx last time the layers of walls of pharynx mucous membrane wall layers ring and then uh, our muscular coat and uh, uh, pharyngomuscular fascia and buccopharyngeal fascia these form the lateral wall coming to the floor floor is again very important floor floor anteriorly is formed by hard palate but posterior part posteriorly it is deficient posteriorly our nasopharynx is deficient that is how nasopharynx communicates the oropharynx i'll explain in detail so anteriorly the floor is formed by the uh, hard palate but posteriorly the uh, floor is deficient that's how there is communication between nasopharynx and oropharynx at the communication like i had explained last time nasopharyngeal isthmus that is the communication between the nasopharynx and oropharynx is guarded by the pseudopharynx ridge okay uh, just a revision point pseudopharynx ridge is mainly formed by the palatoglossal muscle sorry palatopharyngeal muscle palatopharyngeal and a part of superior constrictor minor contribution by superior constrictor but <laughs> major contribution is by our palatopharyngeal muscle okay move on suppose now i am looking at the pharynx from the side i am looking like this you are looking at my nasopharynx this is anterior this is posterior how it looks so here this is our this is our base sphenoid base sphenoid this is being our base or uh, this being our uh, Uh, spinoid bone. This will be our base spinoid. This part will be our base spinoid, and this will be our base occiput. Again, same thing. Like I explained that time, the other time, the floor here, the floor. This will be our hard palate, and posteriorly it is deficient. The floor of the nasopharynx is deficient posteriorly. Okay, like I explained already in the previous diagram. Now. let us talk about our anterior and posterior walls anterior wall is formed by our posterior part of coa posterior coanae posterior coanae what is posterior coanae this is our anterior coanae see the anterior opening of the nose is called anterior coanae the similarly there are two coanae in the posterior part of the nose where nose communicates with our nasopharynx so that is called as posterior coanae and this part this part between the two coanae is posterior part of nasal septum posterior part of nasal septum so posterior part of nasal septum and posterior coanae forms the anterior wall of the nose anterior wall of the nasopharynx sorry anterior wall of nasopharynx is formed by posterior coanae number 1 or number 2 is posterior part of the nasal septum okay now posterior like i told you last time on the shelf like our last class so posterior part of the nasopharynx is related to the c1 vertebra so posterior wall is formed by our arch of atlas vertebra 
patellar vertebra or also called as c1 vertebra okay so arch of c1 vertebra forms the posterior ball of our nasopharynx so this is our basic anatomy of nasopharynx what forms the roof what forms the floor what forms the anterior wall what forms the posterior wall and what we have not discussed about our lateral wall because lateral wall has very important two structures i will explain it now okay now let's go to our lateral wall of pharynx so now i have cut the pharynx okay see i have cut the uh, i have made a person stand in the sagittal view i have cut the pharynx and i am looking at the pharynx okay so this part will be our nasopharynx this part will this box this box is our nasopharynx posteriorly we have our c1 vertebra anteriorly we have nose okay anteriorly nose posteriorly our c1 vertebra now in the nose we have three turbinates three bones which forms the lateral wall of the nose we will study in detail about this lateral wall of the nose when we are doing our nose topic now very important three bones are present in the lateral wall of the nose superior turbinate this is our superior turbinate middle turbinate and inferior turbinate three turbinates these are the turbinates see 1 2 3 3 these three turbinates form the lateral wall of the nose now what is important is that there are two important structures in the lateral wall of the nose let us study what it is okay so exactly 1.5 cm 1.5 cm behind the inferior turbinate there is a swelling in the lateral wall of the nose see 1.5 cm 1.5 cm behind the inferior turbinate on the lateral wall of the nose there is an important swelling on the lateral wall of the nasopharynx in the nasopharynx lateral wall of nasopharynx there is one swelling called as torus tuberius this is our this is our torus tuberius torus tuberius torus tuberius now torus tuberius is a swelling which is around an opening called as we are, we are around opening which is that opening is nothing but the pharyngeal end of eustachian tube eustachian tube is a tube like i told last class it's a tube connecting our nasopharynx and the middle ear okay the pharyngeal end that is the nasopharyngeal end one end of the eustachian tube opens into nasopharynx and the other end opens into the middle ear so the end uh, end opening into the nasopharynx is present 1.5 cm behind the inferior turbinate so this so this opening present 1.5 cm behind the inferior turbinate in the wall of the lateral wall of the nasopharynx it is is the pharyngeal pharyngeal opening of eustachian tube pharyngeal opening of eustachian tube this is a very very important clinical point because most of the nasopharyngeal diseases will cause ear problems because of this opening so if there is any infection or any congestion in the nasopharynx through this opening this congestion or infection travels through the eustachian tube and enters into the middle ear so it will cause middle ear infections now we saw what is present behind the inferior turbinate there is one more swell the one more opening present behind the middle turbinate exactly 1 cm behind our 1 cm behind our middle turbinate there is an opening called as sphenopalatine foramen very important foramen very important first year topic first year of anatomy topic sphenopalatine foramen this sphenopalatine through this sphenopalatine foramen our nasal nasopharynx is going to communicate with the, our uh, sphenopalatine fossa so nasopharynx there is a fossa called as sphenopalatine fossa which is lateral to the nasopharynx which i will explain uh, in our next class when we discuss about nasopharyngeal tumors it's a very important uh, fossa just for the time being you remember this is a foramen called as sphenopalatine foramen which is behind the middle turbinate this foramen is present in the lateral wall of the nasopharynx through the lateral wall of the nasopharynx uh, lateral to the lateral wall of nasopharynx there is sphenopalatine fossa so the communication between this so this is this is our nasopharynx So laterally there is sphenopalatine fossa this is our nasopharyngeal fossa the communication this communication this hole here present which communicates nasopharynx with sphenopalatine foramen so fossa is called sphenopalatine foramen let's discuss sphenopalatine foramen in our next class so let us see this in a cadaveric image how does it look see can you see this is our inferior turbinate okay 
this will be our inferior turbulate this will be our inferior turbulate 1.5 centimeters behind this turbulate you can see a swelling like this can you observe a swelling like this this will be our torus to the area the opening you can see here the opening this opening this opening below the swelling this opening is our pharyngeal end of eustachian tube through which eustachian tube communicates with nasopharynx behind the middle turbinate this is our middle turbinate so this will be our middle turbinate this being the inferior turbinate behind here there is the uh, opening is not seen that is just you know what it is for amen let's see another diagram to appreciate it this will be our superior turbinate superior turbinate this is our middle turbinate this is our inferior turbinate so 1 cm behind the middle turbinate is a one opening called as spinopalatine foramen okay so let us i read about spinopalatine foramen and spinopalatine fossa which is a very interesting topic in our next class okay now let us read about how to examine our nasopharynx so nasopharynx is not uh, uh, it's not visible through the nose in children you can appreciate nasopharynx to some extent if you are doing anterior rhinoscopic examination so if i just look through the nose i won't be able to appreciate nasopharynx in even even in young children or adults in newborn children if i do an examination through the anterior cornea i can i will be able to see the nasopharynx but that is not the case in any children who are more than 1 or 2 years of age by that time where nasal cavity is well developed there will be an arching of nasal cavity so we won't be able to appreciate it so how do we appreciate the nasopharynx so we use an instrument called as posterior rhinoscopy mirror this is a very important exam viva question in final exam of third year exams university exam this is one of the favorite questions of examiner which is instruments we use to uh, see uh, important structures like nasopharynx larynx everything so the uh, what we use to examine our nasopharynx will be our st clair thompson posterior nasal mirror okay so this is our st clair thompson posterior nasal mirror so this has this mirror what is one peculiar feature about this mirror is they have two two bendings okay see there is one bending like this there is one bend like this this is our this is our first bend this is this is our first bend and there is one more bending like this this is our second bend okay the first bend this first bend this first bend is for tongue this bend the tongue will lie below the this bend so tongue will lie here you know this bend now once the after the tongue there is one more upper upper in the upper part we have a soft palate so this bend is for the soft palate so this bend is our for the soft palate okay this bend is for the soft palate this bend is for the lower bend is for the tongue so once we so through the mouth i am going to insert the posterior rhinoscopic mirror through the mouth so this part of the with the upper end with the mirror facing the upper end okay the mirror should face upper okay the mirror so if this is if my hand is going to be the, the mirror so if this is my mirror and this is the hand then so i am going to pass it with the mirror facing upwards okay why am i so, uh, specifying this so much is that there is one more mirror which looks very similar and in exams we are going to get confused usually we are going to get confused if this is a uh, posterior nasopharyngeal mirror or indirect laryngoscopy mirror because indirect laryngoscopy mirror also looks exactly the same okay i'm going to erase this as well see this will be our indirect laryngoscopy mirror this being our indirect laryngoscopy mirror these two look these two look almost the same except there is one difference if you see these bends if you see the bends if you can see two bends like this then it is going to be our posterior rhinoscopy mirror and this indirect laryngoscopy mirror doesn't have any bend it's going to be straight and one more very very important point is that see can you see appreciate here that in when i'm doing indirect laryngoscopy the mirror this mirror part is facing downwards the mirror is facing downwards okay so mirror will be facing downwards so if there is if this is a mirror and this is the handle i'm going to pass it like this i'm going to pass it like this to view the larynx okay this is going to be one very important uh, difference between our uh, posterior laryngoscopy mirror and our indirect laryngoscopy mirror so because it looks almost similar i thought i'm going to i thought i will include this along with posterior laryngoscopy mirror now when i do posterior laryngoscopy what are the structures see 
Okay, first before we see the structures, let us see it in a posterior rhinoscopy image. So this is an image, this is a photo taken of a posterior rhinoscopy. Okay, so this is posterior rhinoscopy. Okay, let us appreciate the uh, what are the structures. Thing. So this huge swelling we see, the huge swelling we see in the roof of the pharynx, roof of the nasopharynx. Okay, the roof of the near the roof. It's actually not exactly the roof. Near the roof and the posterior wall. See, suppose if this is a roof of the nasopharynx, this is a posterior wall of the nasopharynx. This junction, there is a swelling at this junction, and this is this is the junction we are talking about. That is our adenoid tissue. So this part will be our adenoid tissue. Adenoid tissue. Okay. Now, like I told you, the posterior, the anterior wall, anterior wall of nasopharynx is formed by coenae. I told you earlier. So this will be our coenae. Coine one, coine two. Okay, coine one, coine two. Okay, in the coine, if you can observe, you can observe, you can see two bony prominences. Okay, two bony prominences. One, one, two. Two bony prominences. Can you observe it? Two bony prominences. So this will be our a turbinate. This will be our, only two turbinates are seen. Like I told you, three turbinates. But in the posterior rhinoscopy, we won't be able to appreciate superior turbinate. We will be able to see middle turbinate and inferior turbinate. Inferior turbinate and middle turbinate is the two things we can observe. Okay. Now, like I told you, this will be our coenae. Coenae. And very very important this part. This part. Between the two coenae is a nasal septum, and what we see is going to be the posterior part of nasal septum. Posterior part of nasal septum. Okay. Now, very very important structure clinically for any doctor you should not miss while doing posterior endoscopy is this swelling. You can see. I'll uh, I'm going to erase everything else so that we can observe it properly. Okay. Can you appreciate? Can you appreciate this swelling present here? This swelling, this swelling is going to be our torus tuberius. Torus tuberius. This will be our torus tuberius. Torus tuberius. Now, torus tuberius. Below the torus tuberius. See, so I am going to draw it on this side. It's being this doing torus tuberius. Can you appreciate? There is a swelling. There is an opening here. Not a swelling. There is an opening here. The opening. This opening will be our pharyngeal end of pharyngeal end of eustachian tube. Pharyngeal end of eustachian tube. Pharyngeal end of eustachian tube. This opening will communicate to the nasopharynx. Now, one very 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 extremely important clinical point. Is the force of Rosenmuller? Can you appreciate below the swelling? Below this swelling, there is a fossa here. Okay, there is a fossa. This is a fossa. This is just a space. Fossa is nothing but just a space. This fossa is called as fossa of Rosenmuller. Fossa of Rosenmuller. Extremely important point. I'll tell you why fossa of Rosenmuller is so important because this is the most common site of origin of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So if some patient comes with uh, complaints of uh, epistaxis or uh, chronic nasal obstruction and you do an examination of nasopharynx and if you fail to examine fossa of Rosenmuller, you are going to fail as a doctor. Please don't. Please remember. Fossa of Rosenmuller is very important to examine, and it's it's actually not seen because of the swelling. This swelling is going to be so prominent. Torus tuberius is going to be so prominent. The fossa present behind it's present behind the fossa of the sorry torus tuberius. This fossa is present behind the torus tuberius. You won't be able to appreciate fossa of Rosenmuller usually. So you have to be very careful and examine fossa of Rosenmuller because it is the most common site of origin of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So in exams, uh, this is our clinical scene. So in exams how how do we appreciate so there might be question for you in the exam in three marker or five marker question telling that what are the structures seen on posterior rhinoscopy let us draw a diagram for that okay so if this is the posterior rhinoscopy image i'm seeing like i told you there is going to be an adenoids okay this is our adenoid tissue okay and two coenas two coenae and in the coenae what like i told you i'm able to appreciate middle turbinate inferior turbinate Middle turbinate, inferior turbinate. This part will be our posterior part of the nasal septum. Okay, and the swelling present. The swelling present. 
the swelling present on the lateral wall is going to be the torus tuberius the swelling present at the lateral wall is torus tuberous in front of torus tuberous under the torus tuberous there is an opening which is the pharyngeal end of eustachian tube and there is a fossa present the fossa this area the fossa present behind the torus tuberous this is covered by torus tuberous this fossa is covered by torus tuberous and this is called fossa of rosen miller let us just uh, name it okay so point number 1 seen is adenoids adenoids are seen in adenoids are seen in the junction of roof and posterior wall second thing i can see is posterior coene posterior coene okay this is posterior coene third structure i can see is posterior part of nasal septum posterior part of nasal septum okay posterior part of nasal septum fourth structure i can appreciate is torus tuberius torus tuberius and fifth thing i can observe is the opening which is eustachian tube opening which is pharyngeal opening of et tube pharyngeal opening of eustachian tube i will going to uh, for better understanding let me draw a diagram for that and last but not the least i will be able to see fossa of rosen miller fossa of rosen miller it is similar yes was of rosen miller so what do i mean what do i mean by this is that so if this will be our nasopharynx and this is our middle ear cavity okay this is our ear middle ear cavity and this is our nasopharynx and this is the eustachian tube so there is has this is the pharyngeal end of the eustachian tube this will be the oral end or the ear end of eustachian tube this is be our eustachian tube okay this is what i mean and this is the lateral wall of the pharynx this is the lateral wall of pharynx okay this is lateral form so torus tuberius is going to be present like this above the swelling above the opening sorry above the opening there is a swelling called as torus tuberius this is where torus tuberius and behind the swelling behind the swelling here is our fossa of rosen miller okay now what is very very important point is that in the lateral wall like i discussed there are few structures which i discussed in the lateral wall in the lateral wall of pharynx two structures discussed this one is pilopalatine foramen and one more is torus tuberius so what is important is that two most important tumors which we are going to come across clinically in the nasopharynx is one is jna which is juvenile naso nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and one more is nasopharyngeal carcinoma just for time being you remember that jna or juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma most common site of origin most common site of origin of juvenile nasopharyngeal uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma will be our will be our like i told spino palatine foramen spino palatine foramen okay now in most common and for and for nasopharyngeal carcinoma for nasopharyngeal carcinoma most common site of origin most common site of origin for nasopharyngeal carcinoma will be our fossa of rosen muller now you understand the importance of fossa of rosen muller fossa of rosen muller is very very important point for any doctor because it is usually not clearly visible on posterior endoscopy and a clinician might miss a tumor in early stages and it will be a blunder so as a future doctors you should remember that fossa of rosen muller is extremely important area to be examining on posterior endoscopy to not miss the most common site of origin of nasopharyngeal carcinoma okay so this is a very important uh, a uh, clinical point and as well as important question this is going to be a very important mcq question which is going to be asked we will discuss in detail about both jna joseph jula nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and nasopharyngeal carcinoma in our following classes okay now we have done with our uh, structure seen on posterior endoscopy let us just name this this will be our number 1 which is adenoids this will be our posterior coene like i told uh, written here posterior coene posterior part of nasal septum 
This will be our posterior part of nasal septum and torus tuberis, swelling. Swelling is torus tuberis. Below the swelling, there's an opening called pharyngeal end of uh, pharyngeal opening of eustachian tube is point number five. And last but not the least, the fossa present behind the swelling, torus tuberis, fossa frozen molar is point number six. So this is a very, very important exam question as well as a clinical human uh, for us. Okay, but you should not forget the structure seen on posterior endoscopy. Now, one important point before we move on is lymphatics of pharynx, which I didn't do last class. So very, very important point about lymphatics of pharynx is that, we, like I told you last time, so the Waldeyer's ring is uh, is present mainly only in the nasopharynx and oropharynx. What is Waldeyer's ring? It is collect accumulation of lymphoid tissue in the wall of the pharynx. So accumulation of lymphoid tissue in the wall of the pharynx. So whatever the part of Waldeyer's ring present in the nasopharynx, which is uh, uh, which is going to be in nasopharynx, we have two parts. One is uh, adenoids and one more is tubal tonsils. Okay, like uh, behind the torus tuberis, I told you last class, there is a part of Waldeyer's ring present behind the torus tuberis called as tubal tonsils. They drain into retropharyngeal lymph nodes. They drain into retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And the oropharynx, what are all the Waldeyer's ring parts present in oropharynx? Number one is palatine tonsil. Number two is lingual tonsil. Number three is lateral pharyngeal bands. Number four is posterior pharyngeal nodules. These four parts of the uh, oropharyngeal part of the Waldeyer's ring is going to try mainly drain into jugulodiagnostic jugular jugulodiagnostic lymph node is again one of the most important lymph nodes which we are going to study in detail in tonsillitis because this is the main lymph node which is going to be draining our tonsils so this is also called as tonsillar lymph nodes so tonsillar lymph nodes we will again read it in detail in our uh, tons class on tonsils or oropharynx next it's going to be jugular lymph nodes and submandibular lymph nodes and submental lymph nodes. So the primary lymph node draining the all the Waldeyer's ring present in the nasopharynx is our retropharyngeal lymph node. And the primary lymph nodes draining the Waldeyer's ring present in oropharynx is our jugular digestive lymph node, jugular lymph node, submandibular lymph nodes, and submental lymph nodes. And what is important is that retropharyngeal lymph nodes only drains into upper deep cervical lymph nodes. Retropharyngeal nodes, so basically nasopharynx drain into upper deep cervical lymph nodes. But the lymph nodes of oropharynx, that is jugular digastric, jugular, submandibular and submental will drain into all three levels of deep cervical lymph nodes. All three levels of deep cervical lymph nodes, that is upper, middle, sorry, upper, middle and lower deep cervical lymph nodes. So what is important point you have to got for if you take out of this is that all the nasopharyngeal, all nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal carcinomas, all nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal carcinomas will lead to will lead to uh, enlargement of upper deep cervical lymph nodes. So upper deep cervical lymph node is very very important lymphatic drainage of nasopharynx and oropharynx. So examination of upper deep cervical lymph nodes is extremely important in all nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal cancers. We will just study in detail about upper deep cervical lymph nodes and uh, examination of upper deep cervical lymph nodes in our next following classes. Okay. okay. Let us move to our main important, one of the most important exam parts and clinical Clinically, the most important case we see of nasopharynx will be your adenoid. Adenoid is also called nasopharyngeal tonsils. Again, uh, we have discussed a lot of topics in our previous class. Kindly, before watching this class, anyone watching it, uh, not people who are watching it live, but people who are not watching it later, kindly first refer to the class, first class taken on pharynx so that it is going to help you understand this class better. Okay. So, adenoid or nasopharyngeal tonsils. So, adenoid or nasopharyngeal tonsils. What is adenoid? Basically, again, adenoid is a part of our Waldeyer's ring. It is mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, which is present at the junction of roof and the posterior wall of the nasopharynx. Roof and posterior wall of the nasopharynx, there is a uh, mild tissue that is mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Then this is what we call as adenoid. Okay. Adenoid, so this is uh, to be more specific, if this is the roof of the nasopharynx. This is a posterior wall of nasopharynx. There is a lymphoid tissue present at the junction, at the junction of 
our roof and uh, posterior wall and this is what we call as adenoids adenoid if you can observe they have clefts adenoids have clefts in between the clefts in between uh, one important difference you have to note between adenoid tissue and our uh, tonsil tissue is that tonsil has something called as crypts but adenoid have something called as clefts i will explain in detail difference between adenoids and tonsils which is again very important in our next class when we talk about tonsils okay next point so what is the blood supply of nasal adenoid or nasopharyngeal tonsils two important blood vessels which we discussed in sinus of morgagni i don't know if uh, again sinus of morgagni was discussed in detail in our previous class so two important blood vessels which passing through sinus of morgagni will enter nasopharynx like i told you last time in the last class two important blood vessels pass through the nasal uh, pass through the sinus of morgagni which is the space present between the base of the skull and superior constrictor muscle again uh, last class is detailed in discussed in detail two important blood vessels in sinus of morgagni which is ascending palatine branch of facial artery palatine branch of ascending pharyngeal artery these two arteries passing after passing through the sinus of morgagni is going to supply our adenoids so first two arteries is like i mentioned ascending palatine artery ascending palatine artery ascending palatine artery which is going to be the branch of facial artery facial artery second artery being palatine branch of palatine branch of ascending pharyngeal artery ascending pharyngeal artery now third artery again very important artery in the third artery is going to be the ascending cervical branch ascending cervical branch ascending cervical branch of inferior thyroid artery which is a branch of thyro cervical trunk inferior inferior thyroid artery which is a branch of again with inferior thyroid branch tree is again the branch of thyro cervical trunk okay thyro cervical trunk is again a branch of subclavian artery let us read in detail about all the arteries and all the blood the blood supply of the head and neck part in next further part classes but uh, as of now you remember inferior thyroid artery is a branch of thyro cervical trunk which gives an ascending cervical branch to adenoid and inferior thyroid artery is also a branch of uh thyro cervical trunk which is again a branch of subclavian artery okay and last artery from the third part of maxillary artery we are going to get a pharyngeal branch from the third part of the maxillary artery from second part we get a pharyngeal branch to oropharynx but from the third part we are going to get a branch to nasopharynx so pharyngeal branch of our maxillary artery third part maxillary artery third part okay this is the important blood supply of nasopharynx why was oh, it important blood supply of adenoid why is it so important to remember uh, important blood supply of nasopharynx is that jna like i told juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma this is going to be a very vascular benign tumor so one of the most important treatment modalities of jna that is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is embolization of arteries because it's highly vascular tumor it is going to be our was because and also it's because an angiofibroma the main treatment one of the most important treatment modalities is angioembolization so we should it's very important we know the uh, blood supply of the nasopharynx and no supply there are only two nerve supplies two nerves which supply our nasopharynx one being one being cranial nerve 9 which is our glossopharyngeal nerve and cranial nerve 10 which is our vagus nerve because of 9 and 10 if there is any nasopharyngeal lesions there will be a referred pain to our ear this is called as referred otalgia again very important topic in ent which we will discuss when you are discussing ear so referred otal because of the these two nerves 9 nerve and 10th nerve if there is any nasopharyngeal lesions this is going to refer pain to our middle ear so this is called as a referred otalgia okay now 
what is the normal development of adenoids so at birth usually adenoid is not present so i if uh, there is no adenoid tissue present at birth but it will start developing after birth and it will develop the most by the age of 6 years so at birth there will be the size of the adenoid will be zero size of the adenoid is zero from here it is going to develop maximum by the age of 6 years by the age of 6 years it is going to develop maximum and normally the development of adenoid and then after 6 years through the puber uh, this will start regressing more it will start attaining atrophy and by the end of puberty by the end of age of 20 years the adenoid you can't you won't be able to absorb any adenoid tissue so this is going to be our normal development of adenoid tissue okay but in cases of adenoiditis chronic allergy or any chronic infections like chronic medullary infections or chronic pharyngitis because adenoid is a part of walled ear ring the inflammation will persist in the adenoid also so then this is going to cause our adenoid hypertrophy this will cause our adenoid hypertrophy so how does it look in adenoid hypertrophy it starts at 6 years but it is going to persist so this is how it look in adenoid hypertrophy the size size will be zero at birth but after 6 years it won't regress normally normally it should have regressed normally it should have regressed but it's going to persist okay that is what will cause adenoid hypertrophy now before we go to clinical features of adenoid i'm going to tell you common symptoms of nasopharyngeal disease any nasopharyngeal disease or any nasopharyngeal problem will have certain common symptoms okay because of the problem in nasopharynx there are certain common symptoms let us read it in detail so first being nasal first nasal symptoms what are the nasal symptoms which are happening because of any nasopharyngeal diseases not just adenoiditis so common nasopharyngeal diseases will be adenoiditis like i told you two tumors already one is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and one more is our uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma so any swelling or any uh, problems present in our, our nasopharynx will cause these common diseases okay common symptoms okay let us read that in detail so in nasal symptoms first symptom is going to be our nasal obstruction nasal obstruction like i told you nasal coenae the posterior coenae opens into the nasopharynx what is the use is that all the nasal secretions is going to pass through the nasopharynx and is going to pass down through the oropharynx and into a digestive tract but if the adenoid is or any other swelling is present it's going to block the posterior part of the coenae if the posterior part of the coenae is blocked the nasal secretions can't enter into the nasopharynx and you will have a you have feeling of nasal obstruction okay no because of nasal obstruction we are going to have nasal dripping okay nasal dripping and one very rare symptom of adenoid but very common symptom of jna which will happen is epistaxis epistaxis i am generalizing is this i am generalizing all the common symptoms because it's going to help us in a easier way to remember all the clinical features of all the nasopharyngeal diseases suppose you get an exam question of nasopharyngeal disease you have not studied nasopharyngeal disease but you attended this class you can write all the common symptoms all these common symptoms are presented all the nasopharyngeal diseases you can just write or illustrate or tell in viva exam these common symptoms and next is nasinusitis again because of the secretions not being able to pass through the nasopharynx the accumulation of secretions in the nasal cavity is going to uh, enter our sinuses Oh, and then again, it's going to cause a sinusitis. Okay, so sinusitis common symptoms of sinusitis will be uh, facial pain, uh, headache, and all that. Okay, so facial pain, facial pain, and headache. Let us read in detail about sinusitis when we are doing the topic of nose. Now, here very very important part of here is that there are uh, first thing like I already told you, any disease will cause ear pain. Okay, any nasopharyngeal disease will cause ear pain because cranial now 9 and 10 cranial now 9 and 10 supplying the nasopharynx will also supply our ear so whatever problem is there present in nasopharynx it can also cause any inflammation in nasopharynx can cause pain because of referred otalgia because of referred pain through the nerves is called referred otalgia referred otalgia okay now what is one more important uh, a uh, disease which can cause is because nasopharynx has an opening of eustachian tube like i told you last time nasopharynx has an opening of in the eustachian uh, of opening tube in the nasopharynx through this opening the infection will spread be any nasopharyngeal infection can spread through this eustachian tube opening into the eustachian tube and into the middle ear so it can cause infections and these infections can be either 
acute otitis media acute otitis media or or chronic otitis media cs1 chronic separative otitis media we are going to read again very important topic asom and csom in our year classes next one very very important is serous otitis media serous otitis media middle ear will is being up covered by mucosa will always be producing certain will always be producing certain uh, secretions these secretions will be cleared from the middle ear through the eustachian tube through the nasopharynx and it will go down but if eustachian tube opening is blocked the secretions can't pass from middle ear through the eustachian tube into the uh, oropharynx so because of this reason there will be uh, accumulation of fluid in the middle ear and this is going to lead something called as serous otitis media okay these three are very very important or any tumor any tumor in the nasopharynx can spread locally through the opening of pharyngeal opening of eustachian tube into the eustachian tube and into the middle ear okay so these are the three very very important ear manifestations and there is one more very very important uh, uh, how can i say day to day uh, problem with the voice or uh, day to day problem which is a voice abnormality so nasopharynx so when we uh, let us uh, talk in detail about this when we are, uh, when there is voice production which we will study when you are reading or larynx there is a nasal component of voice if you observe because oropharynx and nasopharynx are communicating through the nasopharyngeal isthmus the gap between the nasopharynx and oropharynx at the roof uh, sorry at the floor at the floor of nasopharynx i like i told you earlier in this class at the floor of nasopharynx nasopharynx is communicating with our oropharynx with this communication is blocked then the nasal component of speech is lost and this condition is called as very important this is condition called rhino rhinolalia clausa so this is called rhinolalia clausa or hyponasal speech we will read about hyponasal speech or rhinolalia clausa in detail when we do when we read about speech abnormalities and speech production during after our larynx class okay so this is called as rhinolalia clausa or hyponasal speech where the nasal component of speech is lost okay so there is when we are speaking because there is communication between oropharynx and nasopharynx there is a nasal part of the speech present in all of us but because of the obstruction if there is any obstruction because of adenoid hypertrophy or any other tumor which will obstruct the which will obstruct the nasopharyngeal isthmus that is the deficiency present in the Uh, floor of the nasal pharynx if that is blocked then the nasal component is lost okay now what are the most common causes of adenoid hypertrophy hmm? one of the most important cause is chronic allergy especially these days allergy cases are increasing extremely because of again diet abnormalities we don't have a good diet including me we all have a very bad diet compared to our ancestors and chronic infections chronic infections like chronic infections can be any pharyngitis chronic pharyngitis or chronic ear infection that is cries or chronic separative otitis media any anything because of any of these like i told you already there's all a communication between the nasopharynx and all of these structures so because of infection chronic infections there will be chronic infection of adenoid also so there will be uh, adenoid hypertrophy now clinical features of adenoid hypertrophy adenoiditis or adenoid hypertrophy clinical features we already discussed point number 1 nasal uh, we already discussed nasal obstruction nasal discharge and uh, nasal obstruction nasal discharge and epistaxis very rare epistaxis is very rare in case of adenoiditis if this severe adenoid hypertrophy there will be increased blood supply to the uh, adenoids and it might cause it next is sinusitis sinusitis and oral sinus one important point if you remember is that adenoiditis is the most common cause of adenoiditis is the most common cause of bilateral serous otitis media serous otitis media while well, while well, i will be discussing here i am going to tell you it's one of the most important and common complaints seen in children usually one one ear will have serous otitis media but if any patient is complaining of bilateral serous otitis media bilateral serous otitis media then first thing you have to think is adenoiditis so adenoiditis is again this is very important mcq question what is the most common cause of bilateral serous otitis media the answer will be adenoiditis now next is adenoid phases i'll tell you in detail what is adenoid phases so the uh, patients of adenoiditis will have a typical facies characters is called as adenoid phases 
Next is obstructive sleep apnea. Again, obstructive sleep apnea will be discussed in detail uh, because it's again very, very important um, problem these days because of obesity or uh, many other issues. Again, adenoiditis also causes obstructive sleep apnea. What is obstructive sleep apnea? Apnea for more than 10 seconds and five such episodes in a single cycle of sleep is called as obstructive sleep apnea. Each cycle of apnea being more than 10 seconds and at least five cycles should be present. And then only we will call it as obstructive sleep apnea. We will read about obstructive sleep apnea in, in further classes. Pulmonary hypertension. This is how serious our adenoiditis is. Because of chronic adenoiditis, chronic pulmonary insufficiency cause. Because adenoiditis people, because of nasopharyngeal obstruction, the children will have mouth breathing. Chronic mouth breathing can lead to pulmonary hypertension. And aprosexia, again, is very, very important symptom seen in school children. Aprosexia is lack of concentration. One of the most important reason why our uh, parents bring their children to the OPD will be lack of concentration. And who knows, lack of concentration, the first doctor will be approached is psychiatrist. But here the problem is adenoid. So it's an ENT case, but it might be going to psychiatric psychiatrists. So aprosexia is also very, very important clinical feature seen in adenoiditis. Now, what is adenoid phases? This is a typical phases seen in the, uh, why, it, why am I stressing more on this is because there may be many children around you who might be suffering from this disease. And most of the times this will go unnoticed because the parents hesitate to take the children to any ENT specialist or sometimes a physician might fail or a pediatrician might fail to pick this up. So you being a student of ENT can, should be able to pick this up and you should be able to identify adenoiditis and you should be able to suggest them to go to an ENT surgeon or you should be able to, you should be able to diagnose them being ENT students. Okay. So what are all present is first feature is dull face. Can you observe that this? This child, the adenoid child with adenoid faces is looking very dull. Okay? Second very important feature is um, sunken eyes. Okay? Second very important feature is sunken eyes. Third important feature is hitched up nose. Can you observe? Hitched up nose. The nose is hitched up like this. Hitched up nose. Four point being ever tight upper lip because because the child won't be able to breathe through the nose because of the adenoid being covering the nasopharynx there won't be any passage of air through the nose and down so the mouth the children will adapt mouth breathing so the because of chronic mouth breathing with an open mouth there will be averted upper lip averted upper lip and again because of the same reason chronic mouth breathing the child will have high arched palate high arched palate and because of the same reason, he's going to have crowded upper teeth. Crowded upper teeth. Crowded upper teeth. And one, one last point. Again, because of chronic mouth opening, chronic mouth opening, there'll be loss of nasolabial folds. Loss of nasolabial folds. What is nasolabial folds? Can you observe? So this part, uh, they can see a fold here. This fold, the fold between the nose and the labia, this part, this fold will be lost in these patients. This fold will be lost in these patients. Okay. So loss of nasolabial folds. This is again a very important and favorite viva question. This was asked for me when I was presenting a case of tonsillitis. So in an exam, when I was casing a present of, uh, presenting a case of tonsillitis, the examiner shifted his discussion towards adenoiditis and in adenoiditis, he asked me what are the features of adenoid phases when I was in third year. So again, very, very important uh, features of uh, adenoid phases. Now, before we go to the diagnosis, what is the most common diagnostic criteria we use, diagnosis modality we use is simple, posterior rhinoscopy. One is clinical. We have to clinically see the patient and then one more is that we have to use posterior rhinoscopy. This is the investigation of choice. If you just observe under the posterior anoscope and you see adenoid being uh, enlarged, simple, we already know that it is adenoiditis. So posterior anoscopy will be the investigation of choice. Posterior anoscopy will be the investigation of choice. Now, what is important is that on the X-ray, this is a normal X-ray. Can you uh, appreciate that this is, this is our adenoid tissue and the air can easily pass through because there is no adenoid hypertrophy. But this is the nose. Through the nose, the air will enter 
nasopharynx this being a nasopharynx through the this will be a nasopharyngeal isthmus this is a nasopharyngeal isthmus communication between the nasopharynx and oropharynx nasopharynx oropharynx so there, there there will be easy flowing of air but here if you see this is the the nasal the adenoid has been hypertrophied so adenoid hypertrophy there won't be passage of air there is no passage of air here the air is not able to pass from nasopharynx nasopharynx to oropharynx nasopharynx to oropharynx there is no passage of air so usually we don't use x ray but again this can be a viva question so they might give you a viva question and ask you what is this case you won't even imagine that a nasopharynx uh, adenoid hypertrophy you, you never imagine adenoid hypertrophy can be given on x ray okay so if they give you just observe just observe that the space between the nasopharynx there is no space between for the air to pass there is no space so then observe that the nasopharynx is the nasopharynx is nasopharynx is enlarged okay now treatment first first episode of treat first episode of uh, adenoiditis we always try to do conservative treatment okay conservative treatment what can you give you can give antibiotics one important point i forgot to mention in the causes of nasopharynx one important uh, feature i have forgot is in infections most common infections causing adenoiditis will be our viral infections viral viral infections will be more common than bacterial infections viral more common than bacterial infections okay what is the most common viral infections which can cause common cold also can cause adenoiditis so common cold common cold that is our rhinovirus common cold or influenza virus or para influenza virus many other viruses can cause and here most important being our streptococcus pneumoniae then haemophilus influenzae these infections can cause bacterial infections okay these are the most common infections causing adenoiditis so when when i get a case of adenoiditis i'll always try to first Uh, act upon conservatively by giving antibiotics, antihistamines. Antihistamines because you know, again allergy can cause it, and I can also give them decongestants, nasal decongestants, which will decrease the inflammation in the nasal cavity. Like nasal decongestants, like we would have studied in pharmacology, oxymetazole, deoxymetazole. This can be used as decongestants, and sometimes if fever is present, you can give them. Our favorite dose is fifty, which is our paracetamol, or any other NSAIDs can be prescribed. Now, repeatedly, this adenoiditis is present, or because of adenoiditis, patient is having any voice problem, like is any other clause, or because of adenoiditis, the patient is having CSOM or any other ear infections or serous otitis media, and because of this, the patient is having conductive hearing loss. One important features I forgot to mention here is that because of because of the adenoiditis in the ear because of serous otitis media or acute serous otitis media very importantly the child will come with conductive hearing loss and conductive hearing loss is one of the major important problem seen because if there is hearing loss in a child the child won't develop speech child mainly develops speech by hearing what he by hearing what the other people are speaking to the child but if he or she the child is not able to hear properly then development of speech will also be a problem again there will be the cognitive development also will be a problem so in children below 6 years of age conductive hearing loss is very very serious issue so it's very important we look into adenoiditis okay now coming back to the treatment so if it's causing any major issues like ear issues conductive hearing loss serous otitis media or it is Uh, causing renal ileal clausa because of the speech of abnormalities in children so then we we don't want it because it's just a tissue which is a mild tissue so adenoid can be removed because of adenoid hypertrophy or repeated infections is happening adenoiditis we can remove it surgically so what is one important thing you have to remember is that we while removing adenoiditis I mean by removing the adenoid tissue in adenoid resection we mainly use something called as rose position okay so this is rose position This this is our rose position. 
what is rose position what is definition of rose position rose position is extension at atlanto occipital joint atlanto occipital joint and extension at cervico thoracic joint extension at cervico thoracic joint extension at atlanto occipital joint and extension at cervico thoracic joint see this is cervico thoracic joint here there is extension this is atlanto occipital joint there is extension here also next what is the advantage is that if you put the patient in the rose position larynx will come up larynx will be situated up larynx will be situated upwards so there will be no aspiration one of the most important complication of general anesthesia will be aspiration if you put the patient in rose position aspiration will be present and what is the most important complication most common combo most most important complication the two most important complications one is grissel syndrome grissel syndrome i'll discuss grissel syndrome in detail one is grissel syndrome and one more is coroner's clot clot formed during adenoid resection can pass into the larynx and cause severe respiratory obstruction and this is called as coroner's clot which is a lethal condition grissel syndrome grissel syndrome is nothing but over extension here we have extension in rose position if you keep the patient for too long in rose position so there is over extension at the atlanto occipital joint and that will lead to a syndrome called as grissel syndrome so grissel syndrome is over extension at atlanto occipital joint and this is called as grissel syndrome grissel syndrome we we'll discuss in detail when we are discussing neck and its problems so because of over extension at the atlanto occipital joint because of the neuralgias formed and neuropathy is formed the patient will come with wry neck wry neck is nothing but sternocleidomastoid paralysis we will again discuss when we are talking about uh, neck muscles and neck structures so wry neck is caused because of grissel syndrome now what are the main instruments used i why did i mention instruments because instruments is one of the most important part of our viva examination so when if these structures these instruments will be put in our exam also so three instruments we use during this is a tongue depressor which is called as boil tongue depressor boil tongue depressor mouth gag use this davis mouth gag bipod stand uses brafin bipod stand Drafin by pot stand. So this is our drafin's by pot stand. This is our drafin by pot stand. This is our drafin by pot stand. Here Boyle and Davis. This both Boyle and Davis. So this is our tongue depressor, which is our Boyle. So this is attached to the this whole part. This is the Davis mouth gag. This curved part is Davis mouth gag. It is attached together. This is both is Boyle and Davis mouth gag and tongue depressor. Okay, now last topic of the day. What is nasopharyngeal bursa and bradke sponge? So this is like I already told you. Nasopharynx is present between the roof and the posterior wall. At the junction of roof and the posterior wall, nasopharynx, our adenoid is present. In the adenoid, can you can you observe in the middle of an adenoid there is a recess or a space? In the middle of an adenoid, there is a space or recess called as nasopharyngeal bursa. What is this space? There is a clinical significance of this space. So during the development of, so this is our development of pituitary gland. So pituitary gland has two lobes, posterior lobe and anterior lobe. Posterior lobe is developed from diencephalon. Anterior lobe is developed from rathcase pouch. Rathcase pouch is nothing but it's a part of buccal mucosa. Buccal mucosa. So buccal mucosa, part of buccal mucosa goes upwards through the uh, base of the skull and forms the pituitary gland. So rathcase pouch is a part of buccal mucosa which will form the anterior lobe. So in the pituitary gland, pituitary gland, anterior lobe, anterior lobe is formed by our one minute, anterior lobe, posterior lobe. Anterior lobe is formed by our rathcase pouch, rathcase pouch, which is again nothing but our buccal mucosa, and posterior lobe, posterior lobe is formed by our diencephalon, diencephalon. Okay. Now, when the buccal mucosa, 
when the buccal mucosa is going through the buccal mucosa is going upwards to form the pituitary gland it will pass through this recess it will pass that case pouch the it will pass through this recess leaving a space in during the development of adenoid called as nasopharyngeal bursa so there is a median space in the middle of the adenoid tissue so this whole thing is adenoid tissue the whole thing is adenoid tissue in the middle there is a space there is an open recess in the middle of adenoid tissue and this is called as nasopharyngeal bursa and rat case pouch the remnant of rat case pouch not exactly rat case pouch the remnant it is present on the adenoid as a dimple there will be a dimple on the adenoid which is nothing but the remnant of rat case pouch okay so now what is important is that nasopharyngeal bursitis nasopharyngeal bursitis has same clinical features as adenoiditis same features will have nasal uh, will be enlargement of adenoids because of enlargement of adenoids will have nasal symptoms like nasal obstruction and uh, nasal discharge will have oral or ear symptoms like csom or you, you, your patient might not give a long history for him to develop csom but he can develop acute separative otitis media and very very important feature one characteristic feature is occipital headache the patient will have a back headache okay patient will have a back headache and on posterior endoscopy if you are going to observe this uh, nasopharyngeal bursitis or thornwald's disease you will have a fluctuant swelling fluctuant swelling which is going to have pus white 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 pus uh, exudative openings okay fluctuant swelling present on the again on the adenoid tissue again which is where is a, a junction of roof and posterior wall so this was a class on today sorry for the long class because uh, nasopharyngeal anatomy is a little tricky to understand and again it's very very important for your exams as well as knowing it as clinicians i took a little long class for today so let us in our next class let us study about nasopharyngeal tumors and uh, let us continue with other uh, two very very important tumors of nasopharynx one is jna that is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and other being nasopharyngeal carcinoma so this is this is it for today so if you have any doubts please don't uh, hesitate to contact me on dm or you can put it on white army group or either telegram group or whatsapp group and uh, i will i will be uh, it is my pleasure to address your doubts okay i might also be wrong in some places if you feel i'm wrong at some places you can please approach me and i can correct myself too uh, thank you guys so uh, this is uh, this is it for today thank you